Phaeton and the Sun is a tale from classical Greek mythology that centers on the young son of Helio. The sun god, who daily sped across the sky on his chariot, delivering heat and energy to earth. Phaeton enters Helio's temple in search of evidence of his father's divinity. After establishing their relationship, Helios resolves to provide whatever favors his son wishes. Phaeton rashly asks to personally pilot his father's chariot across the sky, but Helios tries to talk him out of it. However, he is compelled to give it to the relentless Phaeton because of his commitment. Phaeton loses control of the chariot as soon as it takes off, veering off course. It carelessly races across the sky, cutting dangerously close to the surface of the planet and scorching it. The Greeks asserted that the Nile had receded and the Ethiopian people's skin had turned darker at this point, turning the hills of Libya into arid desert. The deserts of Libya and other Saharan countries were not always the desolate wastelands that they are now, despite the fact that this story is totally fiction. Subscribe to AWZ so you can watch the videos we have ready for you in the future. The Earth's orientation in space is far from constant due to its slightly oblate form and the gravitational attraction of other planets in our solar system. This is why its tectonic plates, weather, and seasons are continually shifting. Every 100,000 years, the tilt and wobble of the Earth's orbit change throughout time. Every 41,000 years, the geometry of the Earth's orbit switches between a nearly circular and a slightly elliptical one. The tilt of the Earth's axis varies between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees, and it rotates completely once every 26,000 years. In honor of Serbian mathematician Milotin Milankovic, who initiated research into these three variations in the early 20th century, these three fluctuations are known as the Milankovic cycles. He found that these cycles have a significant impact on the planet's long-term climate by altering the amount and location of sunlight that strikes it. For instance, the longer the seasons differ when the Earth's orbit is more eccentric, and the more extreme the seasons are when the Earth's tilt is greater. However, the relationship between the wobble of the planet and its orbit may be what's most intriguing. Today, the Earth reaches its perihelion, or the point when it's closest to the Sun, in early January. As a result, the planet receives a little more sunshine throughout the winter and summer in the northern and southern hemispheres, respectively. However, this position was reversed around 13,000 years ago when the Earth's wobble was at the opposite end of its cycle. Summer radiation over North Africa was 7% more than it is now because the Earth received a little bit more sunlight throughout the Northern Hemisphere summer and the Southern Hemisphere winter. Although this difference may appear insignificant, it had a significant impact on the climate of the area. As more energy reached the surface, the air became hotter and ascended higher, resulting in a low-pressure zone that, in turn, caused convection to draw moist air from the nearby Atlantic. After rising and cooling, the wet air condensed into rain clouds, which subsequently fell over the Sahara climate. According to models, this process increased rainfall in North Africa by between 17 and 50 percent in comparison to today. Because of the increased rainfall, more vegetation was able to grow along the coasts and southern edges of the Sahara. Because vegetation is denser than sand and absorbs more energy, as well as contributing to the transpiration of underground moisture, this increased vegetation growth led to an increase in rainfall. A positive feedback loop that resulted from increased plant life due to increased rainfall eventually extended vegetation across North Africa. Meanwhile, the additional precipitation started to build up in the region's geographic depressions, creating lakes, some of which were enormous, such as the lakes Megafezen and Anet in modern-day Libya and Algeria, as well as the once colossal Lake Megachet, which at 360,000 square kilometers was slightly smaller than the Caspian Sea and the largest freshwater lake in the world at the time. Today, these lakes trapped water in the interior of the Sahara, along with now-gone river networks, allowing for year-round support of vegetation. Consequently, only 10,000 years ago, practically the whole Sahara Desert was transformed into a lush green area. While this may sound unlikely, there is a wealth of data to support it. 
Ancient peoples painted intricate images of gazelles, elephants, rhinoceroses, hippos, giraffes, and other creatures on the rocks in the Sahara and other areas where there is now nothing but sand. Archaeologists have discovered hundreds of human tombs amid the remnants of land in the now utterly lifeless Tenera Desert in Niger. Ancient riverbeds in Libya, Algeria, and Chad include enormous fish and crocodiles that have been found with signs of human habitation. Sand spits and beach ridges provide proof of the Lake Mega, Chad's old coastline. However, perhaps the most conclusive evidence comes from cores of undersea sediment that were obtained off the coast of Africa and used to research Saharan dust flux. These cores showed that between 10,000 and 5,000 years ago, the amount of sand blowing off Africa was far less than it is today, which can be attributed to increased moisture and plant life. Because of all this evidence, scientists have concluded that between 12 and 5,000 years ago, the Sahara was a completely different region than it is today, covered in grasslands, waterways, and forests, full of animals, and home to ancient human settlements. Additionally, the pollen trapped in these cores reveals increases in plants like grasses and sedges during this time period. The same feedback loop that created the Sahara Green, however, swiftly turned it into the wasteland we know it to be starting roughly 6,000 years ago, as the orbital cycles reversed. In addition, human activities like fire land management and overgrazing of cattle may have further harmed the ecosystem of the area. Within a few millennia after the lakes dried up, plant life moved south, and animals and people soon followed. Despite the situation of the Sahara, it is almost certain that another humid season will occur in the future. In fact, data suggests that over 230 of these green episodes during the previous several million years have lined up with variations in the Earth's wobble. Therefore, if human culture is still active and prospering when the Earth's wobble reverses again in around 13,000 years, researchers anticipate that the Sahara will turn green. By then, this discovery will significantly impact world geopolitics. The arid deserts of Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Mauritius, Mali, Niger, and Sudan will turn fertile, creating new settlement opportunities and probably causing rapid population expansion. Lakes will refill and rivers will run. With the emergence of new cities and even new countries, North Africa will emerge as a new global hotspot. But since this is so far in the future, there is no assurance that human civilization will still be thriving and able to get through this temporal barrier. The Sahara might be made artificially green in the coming generations, according to studies. Unlike the slow changes in Earth's climate brought on by the Milankovitch cycles, the first has already occurred. Earth's climate is currently changing quickly as a result of greenhouse gas emissions caused by humans. More energy is being trapped by these emissions in the Earth's atmosphere and on its surface. While this is undoubtedly exciting, heating up the entire Earth to encourage the growth of more plants in the Sahara is probably not the best solution. Instead, there are other less harmful ways to accomplish the same goal, and perhaps the most promising would actually help combat climate change in the process. Models predicted that establishing massive solar and wind farms in the Sahara, which would roughen the terrain and make it darker, would increase the amount of energy absorbed and cause precipitation to increase in the near future. We may benefit from this by harnessing renewable energy, starting the positive feedback loop, and reviving the green Sahara all at once. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, don't forget to share and click on the notification button for more of our amazing videos.